This is American government, uh, Monday, November 8th, 2021, Day of Destiny. Um, everyone's here. Pardon me? Yes. Um, I just assume that class is so pleasurable for you that, that most of you have the desire. To, no PDA, no tongues. Uh, that, by the way, <laughs> right, I, uh, let me start the recording over. <laughs> Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Pay, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Um, all right, all right. So um, I assume that your 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 experiencing class is so pleasurable that you want the ability to experience it over and over and over again. Am I right? I'm glad you're not. That's not what I was thinking, but. All right. Yeah. Well, bless your heart. All right. So um, uh, what I did over the weekend was, uh, as, let's just say that God is just. And I suffered from what I would call, without being too specific, the president's disease on Friday. No, we don't need to be more specific than that. Um, um, and it's interesting. In my Hamilton class today, because we're talking about exactly the same issues that we're talking about in this class, um, what big – I know this is a terribly framed question, but it actually has to do with what we're discussing – in class, which is the nature of the presidency, etc. So what I did was since uh, on Wednesday, I finished up with parties and returned to presidency origins, and then I was not feeling well on Friday. So late Saturday night, while all of you were out experimenting with illegal drugs and, and setting the town on fire. Actually, I had practice. Yeah, just wow, you had practice on Saturday night? Yes, we practiced till like midnight, basically. What's we your sport? Basketball. Wow. That's yeah, dedication. Um, I actually recorded a lecture on Saturday and I posted it, which is a sort of a reinforcing of, of uh, Wednesday and also kind of a finishing of it. And in that lecture, by the way, I explore uh, what we began to discuss on Wednesday was Hamilton, uh, Nichols number 40, which is a distillation of Federalist 70 through 74. And it explains Hamilton's understanding of the nature of executive power, the requirement for energy, the four tasks of executive power. And what I completed in the lecture as prelude to today were the four institutional ingredients or components of executive power, according to Hamilton. Hmm. If I were to ask you to recite them like a cheer, what would those four institutional ingredients be? The institute, the, ex, the executive, here, here's the, what, the, what I lectured uh, on in that lecture, on both Wednesday and in, in that lecture, in two seconds. The executive needs energy. And then I explain what energy is in my lecture. Why does the executive need energy? Because of the four tasks of the executive. Defense, law enforcement, the providing of fundamental social order out of which the rule of law comes, and ultimately leadership in a chaotic and anarchic world. That's what Hamilton says are the four tasks of the executive power, which explain why you have to have an energetic executive, a powerful, decisive, um, a responsible and, and swift acting executive. Whatever else you want to say about Congress, and there are many things you can say about Congress, you can't say that Congress is decisive. You can't say that Congress is energetic, that it acts with swift and decisive and forceful action, because it's not designed to do that. If it were designed to do that, it would consist of one person. <laughs> so let's turn to the last major thing I explained in, in that lecture, if you've watched it. And that is the four institutional ingredients. So if this is what the executive requires, energy, for its major tasks, defense, law enforcement, order, and leadership, how must you build? What components? What how must you build the institution of the executive branch in order to have those? And what are the four qualities? If you, if you read the material or, or listen to my lecture, what are the four aspects of the executive institution that Hamill says are necessary? Necessary. One, two, three, four. What are they? Oh, Lexi. I want the circle that unity, yes. consideration, yes. adequate support, yes. Excellent. What's unity? 
Nope. If you've listened to the lecture, I don't mean to embarrass you. Unity, very simple answer. What it means by unity. The executive has to be what? A single person. Why were they afraid of a single person executive at the time? Yeah. So what Hamilton is saying to them, I'm sorry, but if you want to have a good government, that means you've got to have a, an energetic executive. And if you're going to have an energetic executive, the first way to destroy energy in the executive is make it plural. And he talks about different ways you can do that. So all, what does unity mean? The executive has to consist of? Second, um, duration. What does duration mean? He means two topics here, which are both talked about in, in the Nichols. So what do you think duration means? How long? How long? Yeah, go ahead, Tiffany. What? How long what? And so obviously, what issue would that clearly touch on? The yes, the length of term, right? And, uh, and re remember, by the way, this is something they had to learn in the Constitutional Convention. Um, most of the terms of the governors were one year or two years, and they couldn't succeed themselves. Why were the state constitutions under the Articles afraid of creating an executive with a long term? So they're afraid it would become like a politics. Yeah, over time. They, you know, I mean, you could say this. If somebody's a popular leader, just being in term for a long time means you gain power. But Hamilton says, sorry, you need that. You've got to have that. Not only because you want the executive to be able to do what he's doing, to know what he's doing. And I think even if you're working at a steel mill, wouldn't you say, Matt, that you got better at what you did the longer you did it? Oh, yeah. I would say that's a lot too. There's learning on the job. Well, ha well, that's the basic meaning of what Hamilton talks about. Especially in the executive, you want some skill, some expertise. And so isn't it clear why you need a long term for that? And, of course, how long is the president's term? Four years. Now, the other aspect of duration that he talks about is what would also make for a longer term for a president? Not just the actual length of his elected term, but what else? Allowing to be reelected. Yeah, that's the other issue he talks about. Re-eligibility. Now, there is one big difference between the original executive and our current executive, and that has to do with the 22nd Amendment. Do you remember what the 22nd Amendment is? Isn't it um, reelected? Yeah, because... And now Hamilton is discussing – now, the fact that we've put a constitutional limit on the number of terms a president can serve, which was originally unspecified, and as you all know, uh, what led to the 22nd Amendment in the 1950s was whose presidential term in the 1930s and 40s? Um, Alphabet soup. F D R. FDR, Franklin Desano Roosevelt, who was elected four times. Now – did you just break wind? No, you just said Delano. Delano. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Cousin to Theodore Roosevelt, by the way. Um, and it's true he only served a couple of months of his last term and then he died. Uh, and here's an interesting thing. Who succeeded him as vice president and president as vice president? Who became president? He was elected. That's one president away. What he Eisenhower was elected first in 1952 and then 1956. Who served as president, who was the vice president under FDR in his last term, served as president and was re-elected in 1948? Robert Clinton. <laughs> 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 That's my favorite. Harry? 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 Harry Truman. And did you know that the first time that Harry Truman learned about the atomic bomb that he had to actually make a decision about whether to use in two months, three months actually, was when he became vice president, a uh, president. Uh, during the whole time of the building of the atomic bomb in the Manhattan Project, uh, FDR never even told Harry Truman that uh, they were building the atomic bomb. So the first major decision he had to make as president mm -hmm. was yep. whether or not use the atomic bomb. Yeah, go ahead, Sammy. I'm from the city where they have the uranium. Really? Oak What's, Ridge, Tennessee. Oak Ridge? Oh, yeah, sure. That means you glow at, at night, right? You glow in the dark at night. Right? Um, think about that. And, and by the way, on the tasks of the presidency, I've taught the presidency for many years, and, I, and I've had students in my class who actually, uh, in response to this question, how many you think you might be president? Any of these people in this class think you might end up as president of the United States? If I'm president, that means I've had two students in my entire time at Congress said they think they're going to end up as president. And so I asked him this question. Are you willing to kill innocent people? Yes. That's not a joke. No. Why is that not a joke? Because 
Because sometimes I've got to do that. That's what they say. Yeah. Um, uh, my favorite example of this, and this is kind of off track, but not quite, was during World War II, the Nazis were also working on an atomic bomb. Uh, and they had some of the best nuclear scientists in the world. They kicked all the Jews out, so that hindered them a bit. I'm serious about that. One of the reasons the Nazis weren't able to develop an atomic bomb was they kicked all the Jewish scientists out. And they were the same thing. Of course. Um, uh, uh, anyway, uh, but the Nazis did. And you may, and if you want to know the source of the story, it's one of my favorite books that, uh, that I, I've, I've actually taught once I love to teach. Write this down. E equals MC squared, the title of the book, by David... Bodanus. It's a fascinating book to read. It's a biography of the equation, E equals MC squared, because he was watching The Tonight Show with, um, who's the guy that replaced Johnny Carson? Uh, and before... Uh, There's a lot of Tonight Shows. So I know, I know. know. Tonight. <laughs> anyway, Cameron Diaz. You know who Cameron Diaz is? Yeah. Uh, kind of a blonde, interesting actress. She asked, so the host um, asked her the question, if you could ask any one question, what would it be? And she said, I'd like to know what equals MC squared means. So Bodanus was watching this, David Bodanus, B-O-D-O-N-I-S, and he wrote a book in response. And it has three parts, how science led up to equals MC squared, and who formulated e MC squared, by the way? Who was the scientist who actually formulated? Einstein. Einstein. How it changed science, but the last part of the book is how it changed human life, and what's the most obvious way in which equals MC squared changed human life? Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, because of Einsteinian physics, that led directly to the discovery of the fissionable atom and the atomic bomb. So the very thing that made us understand much more of the universe around us also put the human race in jeopardy. Uh, because, you know, as I mentioned, the president of the United States today, and this has something to do with what we're talking about in terms of the expansion of power of the presidency, has within 15 minutes of his access, the, the briefcase that the secret ser servant agent always uh, carries, no longer, I think no more than 25 feet away from the president, um, has all the launch codes for nuclear weapons. Uh, the president of the United States can destroy the human race 55 times over. That's power. Um, so anyway, here's the anecdote about killing innocent people that's inherent in the presidency and all executive decision. So it turns out that you need to create an atomic bomb. First, you need to be able to create a controlled fission reaction. Any of you know where in the United States the first controlled fission reaction took place? Mexico. Underneath the University of Chicago football field by Enrico Fermi in 1933. Um, so it turns out to create an uncontrolled fission reaction, which is what an atomic explosion is, you need a controlled fission reaction. To have that, you need something called heavy water. How many of you have had chemistry or physics? What are the two what are the two isotopes of hydrogen? Deuterium and tritium. What's deuterium? Huh? What's deuterium? What's a hydrogen atom consist of? Proton and one? Deuterium consists of one proton and two neutrons. Tritium is one proton and three neutrons. Now, you need that in order to slow down the fission so you can have a controlled fission reaction. We had plenty of that sources in the United States, including Oak Ridge, but there was only one place in Europe uh, which, cr which actually created heavy water, a factory in Norway, which was under the rule of the Nazis beginning in 1940. Winston Churchill found out about this factory and ordered it destroyed. And it was destroyed, but only partially, and the Nazis rebuilt it. And then he heard subsequently through intelligence that they were shipping 10,000 gallons of heavy water from Norway to Germany, which would have enabled the Nazis to build the bomb. Unfortunately, it was being shipped across the fjord and the lake right next to the factory on a civilian ferry that had 1,000 civilians on it. Guess what was the decision that Winston Churchill had to make? And guess what he did? He had the ship sank. He killed a thousand innocent people. But in doing so, what did he do? So think about that. If you're president, the unique responsibilities that fall on presidential soldiers' shoulders uh, really mean if you want to be president, what must you be willing to do? You must be willing to kill innocent people. There's no way to get around it. Let's be clear about that. All right. So 
Um, and the last thing I discussed in the lecture that he talks about in Federalist uh, 50, uh, 70s is not only the task of the executive, not only the institutional ingredients, which are unity, duration, adequate support. And if you've read this selection, if you answer the next question in any way other than the right answer, I'm going to get up and slap you. What's adequate support? Why well, nobody, it all, here's, people, I, I can tell if a student's read it, they'll say, well, you got to get behind the president. Bullshit. Um, adequate support means the president has to have an independent, non-controllable salary. Who sets the president's salary by the Constitution? Congress? But what's the stipulation that the Constitution puts on? The president's salary cannot be raised or lowered during his term of office. Now, Congress has to set the president's salary because it sets the salary of every official in the federal government. Why does it say his salary can't be raised or lowered? Clearly, this is part of the separation of powers. What does it mean that Congress cannot do with respect to his salary? Exactly, or bribe him, because that happened regularly under the Articles of Confederation and the state constitutions, where not only did under the Articles, under the state constitutions, generally speaking, the legislatures elected the governors, and but they could also remove them by a simple vote and control their salaries. Clearly, adequate support, which means the president has to have an independent and non-changeable salary, is part of the separation of powers. You all understand that? And anybody know what the salary of the president is right now? $400,000. It's $400,000. Uh, not, not chump change. How do you know that? I just know a lot. <laughs> Bless your – he has steeled himself to know a lot. That was a pun. Uh, not a good one, but a pun. Uh, and last, competent powers, which are sort of obvious what that means. For the president to do his constitutional task, the constitution has to, has to give him actually a certain apparatus or menu of strong powers. When it comes to war and peace, what's the president's main power in Article 2? He is the chief. commander in chief. The commander in chief. So, in some ways, that's the whole expectation for the president. The only thing I added in that lecture, also from that selection from the Nichols reader, is Hamilton goes on to speculate what kind of passions may draw a person to the presidency. And he has this fascinating analysis of the kinds of passions that draw people into politics. Now you understand, politicians are like you and me, sort of. They're human beings for the most part. Mm. But politicians are like us and unlike us in this respect. Uh, Hamilton says politicians are moved by three, pow three passions, some of which may incline you to, to seek the presidency. Avarice, he says. An avaricious man. What's avarice? Mm -hmm. What is avarice a synonym for in common language? It's love of what? Power. Money. And av avarice means greed. So does greed draw people into politics? Yeah. Yeah. Love of money? How about the next one, he says, is ambition. And what's ambition? Love of, as you said, Sophia, power. power. Now, I think he suggests that ambition will make somebody do more extensive things than love of money. But then he says there's a third passion. And the reason you have to construct the presidency this way is it's the only way to appeal to this passion. I'll quote it. Even the love of fame, the ruling notion of the no, the ruling passion of the noblest minds. Can you be eternally famous if you become a mayor? No. It, not impossible. What about a representative, a congressperson? Yes. There are a couple Can of famous congresspersons. How about senator? Pardon? There are more famous senators than non-famous senators and more historically famous senators, but... What's the only office that offers any possibility of, gravita uh, gra uh, of gratifying the love of fame? Because let's be clear what fame is. As, and this is what I said on my lecture that you may or may not have listened to. Mm -mm. You know who Justin Bieber is, right? Yeah. Lady Gaga? Yeah. How many people do you think are going to know who those people are 20 years from now? Not me. Maybe a lot of people do. Frankly, I mean, it's the, you could say the Beatles, they're going to last forever. In fact, I think John or Paul actually said they were more famous than Jesus. Um, um, Elvis Presley's probably pretty famous, right? How many of you know who Dorothy McGuire was? One of the most famous actresses of the 20th century. 
And here, here's a room full of people you can't even remember her name. I really don't think Justin Bieber, whatever you want to say about him, is going to be remembered by anybody 20 years from now. How do you know who Justin Bieber is? I heard his name once. Also, he was involved, I think, in a wardrobe malfunction with Janice Jackson in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Is, is that right? I a mean, couple of years Jackson ago? I mean, Janice Jackson had one, but I don't care if it was just... I thought it was like Justin it was Bieber, Bieber, like, it's just... Yeah. Maybe it was... Ugh, the same first name. Justin, Justin Bieber is in Zoolander. What's the difference between celebrity, which is what those people possess, and fame? Fame lasts. Fame lasts. Fame lasts. It's like secular immortality. You can probably... How many people are there in the world today? Uh, seven billion. About eight billion. How many human beings have ever existed since the time that we crawled out of the G dining trough? I think probably 10 billion is what's estimated. from the Like, like from the time of the emergence of cave people in New Jersey in 1934. Um, um, so 10 billion people. How many people of those 10 billion people are going to be remembered a thousand years from now? What's going to happen to you? 15. What's going to happen to you guys? We're going to die. You're going to die. Some people will remember you, right? But they're going to die. And if you walk over to that old cemetery down two blocks down the street, you'll see the oldest ones. You can barely read the names. We all die. We all fade. But aren't there some names that will never die? Caesar, Alexander, Joe Dunn, um, um, Lincoln, Washington. Even Hitler and Stalin, even the worst of – the point is fame is a secular immortality, and there's only one thing, and this is what's underneath Hamilton's analysis. The only way to get, get fame is to do great things. But to do great things, you have to have uh, the constitutional powers and scope to do it. So that tells you in some ways what kinds of individuals Hamilton hoped would be drawn to the presidency. And do you remember our acting out of the Electoral College? Do you remember the only thing, if you remember, on the meetings of the electors, without any candidates, without any campaigns or parties or, or, or any other, the only re the way that a majority of electors could even come to a consensus about somebody is if they already possess something like fame. Does that make sense? So in some ways, that gives you some sense of the office. Now, as I pointed out in my lecture, there was a debate between Madison and Hamilton, and we're going to come back to that today about where the power and locus of the main, the main anchor of the U.S. government was supposed to be. Madison hoped that it was going to be the legislature and especially the Senate, that somehow the Senate would be the leader of American politics. Hamilton, from the very beginning, always argued it had to be the president. And you're going to see Hamilton won that debate because when we look at the historical changes of the presidency, which we'll turn to right now, in some ways you're going to see that there, the presidency is the focus of our constitutional system. Hamilton foresaw that and actually hoped for it, and in some ways you could say whatever else, whatever sources of power and influence in our constitutional system, the presidency really is at the center of it. So uh, with that in mind, if you're, uh, I only want to discuss a couple of points, and then I want to uh, talk about the main issue from Chapter 10, because remember the way that I'm doing all the institutions of the constitutional framework are first the original intentions, historical changes, and then questions and criticisms. So uh, uh, having talked about the original intention, what we're talking about now is how did the presidency develop and what have been the major changes. But before we come to that, there are a couple of issues in Chapter 10 that are worth paying attention to. Um, there is a parallel discussion in Chapter 10 that parallels the discussion in Chapter 9 of Congress versus Parliament. At the beginning of Chapter 10 is discussion of presidential systems versus uh, parliamentary systems. And in some ways, these two discussions in Chapter 9 and Chapter 10 parallel each other because the main feature of a presidential slash congressional system is that the legislative power is separated institutionally from the executive power. The main feature of a, pre of a, of a uh, parliamentary system, which you know from Chapter 9 and also repeated here is, in a parliamentary system, there is no constitutional separation of legislative and executive. And that means when you vote for the legislature, you're ultimately voting for the executive because what's the, pre what's the chief executive called in the parliamentary system? The chief executive? In a parliamentary system. The prime, minister. the prime minister. 
but the prime minister is the chief of the majority party in the legislature. So in some ways, look at, at Wilson's discussion of the differences and advantages and disadvantages between a presidential system and a parliamentary system. They parallel his discussion of the differences and disadvantages and advantages of a congressional versus a parliamentary system. The other discussion you should pay attention to at the beginning of chapter 11, and it's actually playing out in dramatic reality in front of our very eyes, is he raises the question of gridlock and unified versus divided government. And, and I mentioned, we're gonna come back to this in Kennedy's speech uh, in a minute. What's divided government versus uh, uh, unified government? What does he mean by that in chapter 10? Divided government is where, um, isn't it where like the president is one party but Congress is controlled by the opposite party? Right, either one or both houses. And um, clearly what's unified government? When they're all the same party. What do we have right now? Uh, we have like a barely unified, like. Why? Because Congress is only. What party is President Biden? Democratic. What party controls the House? Democratic. Isn't it a tie right now? In the Senate, though, it's, it's a 50 50. But it's still control of the Democrats. Why? Because the vice president gets the last vote. By the way, how many of you paid attention to the election returns from last week? What? You know that who won in the governor's race? Um, hold on. Who won, the Republican or Democrat? Republican. Yeah, Glenn Youngkin, the boat, beat, boat, <laughs> beat that boat, beat, beated. What's the past tense of beat, to beat somebody? Beaten. I beated? Beaten. They have been beaten. Who beat them in Glenn Youngkin, Youngkin won over Terry McAuliffe. Terry McAuliffe was an, an assistant and a campaign manager for the Clintons back in the 1990s and 20s. And he was actually governor of Virginia for one term, but governor's, uh, Virginia's constitution forbids a governor to succeed him or herself in one term. So um, it turns out that in the Virginia, actually, they are now in the same situation, but just the reverse that we are in Congress and the president. Because Virginia, interesting enough in its constitution, I know I live there, um, uh, whereas, for instance, because of the 12th Amendment, most of you got this right on the exam, what was the, there were two major changes in the 12th Amendment. What was the first one that almost everyone got? What did the 12th Amendment do? It, um, it changed the number of electoral Right. Yeah. It didn't change the number of ballots each, each elector got. What did it change? How they voted for president and vice president. In the original Electoral College, how did the two ballots for each elector work? Voted for president and whoever got second place became vice president. That's right. What did the Twelfth Amendment do? It made it one ballot for president. Right. One ballot. So when we vote for president today, you automatically vote for vice president because we do it by party and the changes that we talked about. Virginia is different in that they elect their president, their governor and lieutenant governor on a completely separate ticket. They're elected independently, and moreover, like many states. Virginia actually elects the third major next office in line, the attorney general. So each of the three top positions in Virginia government are elected independently. They all went Republican. And by the way, the lieutenant governor is kind of an interesting person in herself. Why? She's very interesting. She's very interesting. Who is she? she her name is interesting. Winsome Sears, a first-generation Jamaican immigrant, the first black woman elected to a statewide position, in, in, in uh, Virginia, and she's an ex-Marine. Her campaign ad had her standing with an AK-47 and saying, this is your next lieutenant governor. All right. My point here is that the, the Republicans actually won back the House of Delegates, which was like the Virginia House of Representatives. You said, Sammy, that the House was evenly divided. That's not quite true. Who actually has the numerical represent the majority in the House? Democrats. By only a five-vote margin. You understand that's almost 50-50, but it's still a majority. In Virginia, the Republicans won back the House of Delegates like the lower house, and the Virginia Senate is now 50-50. Guess who votes to break a tie in Virginia Delegate House Senate? It's the lieutenant governor. So the exact opposite of the U.S. Congress and president is now president in Virginia. It's kind of interesting. Now, um, so we have a unified government. It's interesting what Wilson does in that chapter. Which would you think a unified or a divided government would be more 
effective at getting a political program in place. And what he does is he shows, interestingly enough, that's not the case, that some of the most important pieces of legislation in history have actually been under divided government. And so on one level, even though I will argue, both from our discussion of the party system and when we turn to Kennedy's campaign speech on the presidency, and that article I sent out to you from the Wall Street Journal about the four different parties in the national government right now, I want to refer to that. There is no question that party government helps the president govern. But it's an interesting question whether it helps him govern simply when his party is in power in the Congress, or her power, her party, or even if it's the opposite party. And why would it be? Why might it be that having Congress controlled by the opposite party might be favorable to a president getting his or her legislative program through? Because they'll make deals with each other. Yeah, no, it's, it's, that's clearly it. And even if you could say the party in opposition is in power, you still have somebody to negotiate with. So it's interesting. I think that's actually one of the most interesting discussions from this chapter. The other thing I wanted to bring your attention to before we talk to the main issue in Chapter 10, which is the, the historical changes in the presidency, which I summarize in one word, Lexi. Wow. Wow, that's the word. <laughs> Growth. We'll come back to that. Um, is, is, it's interesting. Um, uh, Wilson says uh, that the, the, president's, uh, the powers of the presidency and the Constitution are skimpy. Um, uh, in fact, I give you the page reference there. It's page 201. Taken alone, this list of powers is not very impressive. Yet, uh, as you're going to see, because of the Hamiltonian interpretation of Article 2, actually the president's powers, the skimpy constitutional powers, have turned out in history to be actually the center of the constitutional system. Now, part of that has to do with the growth of the nation and the growth of the presidency. So, And if you're looking at the notes, Roman numeral 2, the main key is growth. You should have put that in all caps. I should have, but I put it in uh, uh, quotation marks. And that means three kinds of growth. One of which, by the way, we won't examine until uh, Friday in chapter 11. And that is chapter 11 is chapter 10 is on the presidency and the executive branch in general. Chapter 11 is on everyone's favorite subject, the bureaucracy, uh, which means the ad administrative component of the executive branch. So, um, we will come back to that question of the size. But here's what that means. When George Washington uh, became president uh, in 1789, the executive branch consisted of him, the vice president, who was who? Who was the vice president under George Washington? John Adams. Um, and Thomas Jefferson was the vice president under John Adams. Um, but uh, uh, um, it consisted of him that... The five heads of the departments that Congress created, the Secretary of War, the Secretary of uh, the Interior, the Secretary of the Treasury, who was who? Who was at Washington? Alexander State? Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, the Attorney General, who's the head of the Justice Department, and I blanked on the fifth branch, plus about 800 soldiers left over from the Continental Army. And by the time that 1789 was over, uh, the executive branch had expanded to about 57 to 60 officials, mostly in the Department of Treasury. Today, the executive branch is an institution of over 2 million people. That sounds like growth, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, most of those are, in fact, members of the armed services in the Department of Defense. But um, it turns out that, and then we'll come back to this, the pyramid of the executive branch um, uh, only the very top, as you're going to see when we, when we come back to this question, is controlled by the president. The president appoints today only about 3,000 uh, top members of the executive branch. And the rest is uh, covered by a system called the civil service system, which we'll talk about on Friday. So the, the presidency has grown institutionally, obviously. It has also grown in terms of scope and function, primarily through the rise of the national economy and the expectation that one of the tasks of the national government is to regulate the economy, and indeed the rise of the welfare state. So the second reason and the second sense in which the executive, the presidency and the executive branch has grown is real scope and function. We expect government to do much more than what government was expected to do in 1789. Um, for instance, uh, if you survive a hurricane or a flood, what's the institution that actually helps you get over it? 
FEMA. Have you ever heard of FEMA? Mm -hmm. The Federal Emergency, uh, Emergency Management Agency. Uh, and so in some ways, the idea that if you were caught in a flood or a tornado, that the federal government would help you with assistance out of a natural disaster, that simply was not one of the expectations of government in 1789. Now we also expect government to feed the poor, uh, to provide housing, to provide all the aspects of the welfare state. So there's no question that this, the reason the executive branch has grown is because the scope and function of government has grown. People expect of government a lot more than what they expected originally. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, the third sense <coughs> in which the executive branch has grown is in simple power and weight within the constitutional system. And I think this is probably ascribable to several changes in the nature of the country. Today, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, wouldn't it be fair to say that the United States at this point is still the most powerful country in the world? Yes. Now, there's a, there's a runner-up catching up very quickly, China, China and, and intends to catch up and super, uh, surpass us. And I have to say the consensus of thoughtful elites in this country is that probably by the end of the decade we are going to be at war with China. Oh, right. That's what they're saying. Uh, uh, anybody know what's going to be the issue? What do you say? They have more nuclear weapons now? No, they don't. We still have more nuclear weapons than anybody else. But the issue is that it's the most powerful countries in the world. We get like a lot of supplies, like a lot of products. Yes, we're economically and debt dependent on them. A lot of that thirty trillion dollars in debt is actually held by Chinese businesses and even the Chinese government. On the other hand, they wouldn't use that as a weapon against us because why? Because we are, in fact, their major trading party and their main consuming party. So if they destroyed us through using debt as a weapon, what would that undermine? Their income. Right. It would, it un so, but on the other hand, there is an issue looming and will probably, perhaps, before the end of the Biden administration, lead to armed conflict with the Chinese. Anybody know what that issue is? Taiwan. So you might want to look into that. The Chinese are intent on bringing Taiwan back into their political system. And the reason the Taiwanese want to re re resist this, by the way, Taiwan, which was a province of China, after the communist revolution, the old government fled to Taiwan and established a kind of a regime in exile there. But the Chinese have always viewed Taiwan as part of their province. And so in some ways, they see it, and this is Xi Jinping has, has uh, reinforced this, as one of their foreign policy aims is to bring Taiwan back into the orbit. Having done that, what has China done to, to Hong Kong? And what, was, what's, what was up with Hong Kong before 1997 and now? What's going on there? Lots of things. Are they protesting? Used to. Uh, democracy. Yeah, in 1997, who owned Hong Kong before the People's Republic? Great Britain. Great Britain. And in 1997, they signed a treaty with the uh, People's Republic to turn it back over to the People's Republic as long as... They left Hong Kong's political culture and independence intact. They have not lived up to that. They've suppressed, actually. And so one of the reasons Taiwan wants to resist this is because they're afraid the same thing that happened to Taiwan, uh, to Hong Kong, is going to happen to them. How many of you follow the NBA? Like, like basketball? Yeah, there's a Boston Celtics player that just got in big trouble. Um, because it turns out, what's the fastest growing market for the NBA? in the world today? China. And China is a major market for the NBA. China has clamped down on any basketball team or player in the NBA that has criticized its treatment of Hong Kong and the Uyghurs, the Muslim minority uh, whom uh, the Chinese are exterminating in the North. And uh, again, I don't know basketball players, but one of the basketball players in the Boston Celtics dared to criticize him. And the Chinese said they will not let any Boston Celtics game play in the People's Republic until he's fired. So um, anyway, interesting sidelight. So what has happened to the U.S. between 1789 and 2021? A lot. A lot. Uh, but the main thing is that I'm talking about here is we, we, we went from one of the poorest and most um, uh, weakest nations on earth uh, to the most powerful nation on earth. What branch of government did that naturally and obviously favor? The executive branch. Because if you look back at what we talked about uh, in terms of Hamilton's expectations for the presidency, there's no question that the framers thought that the president would be the focus of foreign affairs. 
And that has always been the case. But with the rise of the United States of a world power, the increase of the United States' power has meant the increase of the power and influence of the executive branch and the presidency. So in some ways, we expect the president to be the primary governor of U.S. foreign policy. And even though the Senate and the House have important roles in that, there's no question that the presidency is the center of U.S. power when it comes to foreign affairs. There's another thing that happened, completely independent of, uh, of uh, the rise of the U.S. as a national power, even the scope and expectations of the government. Completely, completely accidental. And yet, the development of this has favored the presidency and the power and influence of the presidency more than any other independent factor other than the economy and world affairs, and that is media. Um, it turns out uh, that with the rise of the mass media, and what was the first mass medium? TV. Before TV, radio. radio. Oh. Calvin Coolidge was the first president in 1922 to speak to the entire nation through radio. Very quickly, the presidents understood, and FDR was a master of this with his fireside chats. The, the mass media established a direct and immediate influence between the president and the American people, and then television. And you could tell that television had become central to the president's power in 1960 with the first televised presidential debates between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. It's interesting. Those people that watched the debates, have you ever seen any clips of that on the first pre presidential television debate? Yes. Generally speaking, people understood Kennedy to have won the debate because why the day before, the night before, Nixon, getting out of a car, stumbled and injured his knee, which got infected. And during the debate performance of the next day, and Nick, Nick, uh, Nixon always had like big jowls and a fat nose. But then he also had a terrible five o'clock shadow. But he was also under the influence of, of antibiotics on the debate. And those people that watched the debate actually thought that Kennedy won. Interestingly enough, those people that heard the debate on radio thought Nixon had won because it was just the image uh, uh, in some ways. And that shows both the power and the limitation of television as a source of political power. Because in some ways, can you see why it favors the presidency? Congress, as we saw, always looks like a brawl. But yet the president, who can master, I mean, if the president wants, he can command all major networks to pay attention to him. And to some degree, with the rise of the internet and social media, I'd have to say, for better or worse, and I don't care where you stand politically, for better or worse, for better and worse, President Trump was the first president to use Twitter as a political extension of himself. So on one level, the growth of mass media has meant an expansion of the centrality and power of the presidency too. Does that make sense? Um, so um, what I want to do for the rest of the minutes, and we'll finish with this on, on Wednesday, is is to continue with this question of uh, historical changes, primarily by looking at two uh, excerpts from the Nichols Reader. The one is a court case, one of the most important court cases in the history of the country, U.S. v. Curtis Wright. Um, and then the other one is the campaign speech on the presidency from John F. Kennedy on the four kinds of presidential leadership today. So uh, if you're looking at the notes, um, what I want to do is walk you through the court case. And so you understand the issues and how it supports the notion of the presidency as the most powerful institution, the central institution in foreign affairs. Hmm. Tiffany, if you would read on page two at the top. But the presidency. Okay. But the presidency is also governed in power and is practically an input. Although this has often been a question on the first day of the Supreme Court. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a typo. It should be the occupant. So take all your pens and change occupancy to occupant. And you see my point here. President, the presidency is more powerful, but the actual power of any particular president often depends upon the character and abilities of the person sitting there. Does that make sense? Are you all right? Okay. Um, uh, Lexi, would you give her a back rub? All right. Just try to be helpful. Um, um, all right, go ahead. Why do you remember FDR? Why do you remember Abraham Lincoln? Why do you remember George Washington? They were, they were, they were presidents at critical 
points. Yeah, so in other words, understand the power of a president, a particular president, may be this kind of interesting intersection of circumstances, which you can't control, and character, which you can control. How many of you know who was the 13th president of the United States? That's very close, but not. Uh, uh, Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. I was going to say, I think Lincoln. Millard Fillmore. Yeah, I never remember his name. How many of you have ever heard of Millard Fillmore? Yeah, it's Probably video. from some oblique reason. Why don't you remember Millard Fillmore? Because yeah. Millard Fillmore was Millard Fillmore. And the other thing is, there was nothing going on in the country at that time. So in some ways, you could say that the power of the presidency and his capacity for fame partially depends upon his character and abilities, but also in terms of what's facing the nation at the time. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, we'll stop and go away now. I will post this recording.